So uh, welcome, welcome to this episode of Why Femba. My name is Dylan Stafford. I am your host. I am an assistant dean here at UCLA Anderson, and uh, I've been here for a lot of years. And it's my pleasure to get to lead this conversation. We call it Why Femba. Uh, we have our other events where we talk about what Femba is and how to get admitted. Uh, we have our Ask Me Anything sessions with our mm -hmm. ambassadors, our volunteers. But tonight, really, I wanted to look at the big picture, sort of why would you do this? And if you were to do this and have it really sing, have it be the best it could be in your life, how might you uh, go about sort of framing your choice for graduate school, for graduate school uh, you know, pathway in business, keeping your job, and then, and then UCLA? Why would we possibly be the home that would be the right home for you? So... Uh, I have been thinking about this a lot. I got up about three o'clock this morning, worked on my deck this morning. Um, so I've been kind of excited about getting to have this conversation with you all tonight. And um, and yeah, we're gonna have some fun. I, we may go the whole hour and a half if we get done sooner, that's fine. Definitely gonna leave a lot of time for questions um, in, the, in the time together tonight. So thank you all for being here. So with no further ado, let me proceed. So um, I, I want to try to keep this interactive tonight. So I've got these little, uh, these silly little blue icons. And um, anytime you see one of those, we'll have one of those every three or four minutes or so. Uh, it'll be a chance for you to write some things in the chat so I can just hear from you and, and get some one word answers to various questions. So uh, we'll practice this right now. You may hear a tiny bit of a twang when I talk. So I'm from the Southeastern part of the United States originally. So uh, throw your, if you don't mind, just throw in the chat. Uh, tell me where you think I am from originally. We'll test out this chat feature. Let me get over here so I can watch what your answers are. Hopefully I have that enabled. So I'll talk a little bit more. Kentucky, South Carolina, Texas, Alabama, Georgia, Illinois, Louisiana. All right, okay, this is gonna work great. All right, I love it, I love it. Tennessee, Tennessee, Chattanooga. All right, Georgia, Michigan. All right, I sound like I'm from Michigan. How did that happen? No, I am from Texas. All right, very good. Okay, well, we'll do that tonight. That'll just give us something to do to keep the interactions flowing. So um, yeah, so I'm Dylan Stafford. I'm an assistant dean here, uh, UCLA Anderson. I have, um, I have an MBA from Chicago Booth. I was a full-time MBA student. I was second youngest person in my class. So I, I got my MBA just two years after undergrad, which is one way to do it. Uh, it's not the fully employed MBA program way to do it, but it's it's a way to proceed. And uh, had concentrations in finance and marketing. Before that, I'm from Texas. I uh, went to Texas A&M originally with a bachelor's degree in history. And after I got done with Chicago, I spent six and a half years with a German electronics company, Siemens. Started in uh, Palo Alto and Santa Clara, actually in Silicon Valley. I was up there for two years and then got a promotion to the world headquarters in Munich, Germany. Got to live there for three years from 97 to 2000. Worked really hard, learned German, and uh, had a tremendous opportunity to work at a world headquarter for a Fortune 50 conglomerate. Definitely a wow MBA outcome that I could have never earned with just a bachelor's degree, or at least I didn't know how to earn it. And uh, then I got laid off after 9-11. My whole group got let go. If I wanted to stay with Siemens, I had to go to Florida or New Jersey. But my girlfriend, who's became my fiance, who's now my forever wife, she's over here listening to me. So I got to be on my best behavior. My wife, Marissa, had a promotion with her job that brought her to Los Angeles. And so I used my MBA to come to LA, brand new city, did a new job search, got a little foot in the door job at UCLA. Never thought I was going to stay. Thought I'd be there a year and then go do something else. And uh, that was 19 years ago. So I'm coming up on my 20th year and uh, got to be a dean about a decade ago. I love what I get to do. Super fun to talk with people about their hopes, their dreams, investments that they might make in themselves. Graduate school is a big investment. Why would you want to do that? Would it work for you? Is it the best choice? Is it a good choice? Is it a, you know, does it fit for you now? Does it fit for you in this window of your life? So um, I have a podcast. I'll talk a lot about my podcast tonight because I want to give you a lot of links at the end of this episode where you can uh, listen to some real first person success sharing stories from our students and alumni. Um, so I'll tell you about that. It's called UCLA Drive Time. Uh, I've written two books since I started working at UCLA. We always say that um, 
entrepreneurship is in the water at UCLA. So I always had the itch to write a book and I wrote my first one in 2010, wrote my second one eight years ago, uh, excuse me, eight years after that in 2018. I teach, I teach a, a module called Stand and Deliver. It's a crash course in public speaking. I teach that during orientation. So if you come to UCLA this fall, I'll get to teach you um, in August. And I teach something called Leadership Labs, which we will run this, um, this summer in June. And that's a new admit, that it's a new admit activity that I run with a really cool professor from social welfare. And it's, uh, it's an interdisciplinary networking for zero year students from management, from uh, David Geffen School of Medicine and from the uh, Fielding School of Public Health. So that's called Leadership Lab. And I'm a big cheerleader. I've spoken to thousands of people about UCLA in my almost two decades here. And I myself am still writing my MBA story. I got an MBA, I invested in grad school. I get to be a husband, I get to have a wife and a family. I have two wonderful sons who are running around here and uh, you know, living the COVID dream, doing all this good deal. So um, that's a little bit about me and I'm just grateful to get to talk with you tonight. So here's our agenda, you know, why FEMBA? You know, that's what's in it for us. Why would we want you to know about FEMBA? What could it do for you? But really, you know, for you tonight, if I'm gonna make an investment in grad school, I want this to, um, I can't read that. What's that say, buddy? I don't see the record button. You don't see the record button. Uh oh, Christian's worried I may not be recording. Uh, no, I'm recording. See how yeah. it says pause recording? Yeah. All right, thank you. That's my, um, that's my IT consultant, my eight-year-old IT consultant um, who's helping me out tonight. Thank you, Christian. So, um, you know, how could we get you thinking tonight about really writing what your future is going to look like? If you could write your life story, would UCLA be a trustworthy partner to write that life story? And I say it would. I say we'd be an incredibly trustworthy partner. And I want to give you all kinds of evidence tonight. But, you know, just because we know UCLA is great, it still has to fit for you. And so I want to, I want to kind of frame the two parts of my presentation before the Q&A. 15 minutes or so, I just want to frame UCLA and you, because UCLA is one of the premier human organizations on the planet. It is a special, special place. And I want to, I want to talk with you about UCLA. And then I want to flip it and really look at the fully employed MBA program, UCLA Anderson, and really think about you plus UCLA. So about 20 minutes UCLA and you, about 30 minutes you and UCLA, and then you know, we'll have We'll have time at the end for, for Q and A. All right, so that is our that is our agenda. So thank you for being here, and I'm just curious where you're uh, logging in from. So we'll do the we'll do the chat again. Tell me tell me uh, what city are you listening from? I love to just get a sense of where people are. L A L A San Jose Brentwood Culver City. I love Culver City Canyon Country L A L A Huntington Beach Seattle L A. What else we got? Brentwood, hey, two for Brentwood. LA, Fresno, all right. San Francisco, Beverly Hills, Redondo, Inglewood. All right, anybody else? Portland, a couple more from out of state. Mar Vista, Hawaii, Hawaii. <laughs> Cynthia Somerville, are you from Hawaii? I love Cynthia Somerville, she's my buddy. LA, Mar Vista, all right, Playa Vista. Okay, excellent, excellent. Well, thanks wherever you're beaming in from. We are grateful that you're here with us tonight. All right, so why UCLA? UCLA plus U. So let's just let's just do a quick overview. You may know a lot about UCLA. Many of you went here for undergrad, um, but some of you may not be familiar with UCLA. Shame on me. When I got to Los Angeles, I actually didn't know a lot about the University of California at Los Angeles. So let me share with you some high level great facts about UCLA. So if you don't know this, we are, um, according to US News and World Report, we're the number one public research university in the land. And that is a big honor. It's an honor that applies to the entire campus, undergraduate plus graduate. And it is an honor that we have um, been proud to have for the last four years. So 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020, we've been evaluated the number one university, public research university in the United States. There are lots and lots of other rankings, but um, that's a one that we're pretty darn proud of. Uh, within Anderson, the part-time MBA program, we are, since we're in, this will be the 34th entering class of fully employed MBA students this year. 
And uh, so for the first 33 years, we've always been the number one part-time MBA program in Southern California. Um, half that time, we've been best in the West. It's either us or Berkeley. So we really are a wonderful destination. UCLA overall, UCLA Anderson in particular, and the fully employed MBA program in specific. And so we'll talk about that. So, um, you know, you're part of an organization that attracts global talent from around the world. UCLA is the most applied to undergraduate program in the nation. It's been that way for a decade. This year, our applications are up 28% from 108,000 freshman applications a year ago to 139,000 freshman applications for the fall of 2021 currently. So just really incredible um, activity in the sense of people wanting to apply to UCLA. You know, I won't go into this too much because it's mostly for undergrads, but just to say it, because these are really wonderful accomplishments, plus 28% freshman applications overall, plus 48% African-American applications for the freshman class, 34%, 33, 16, you can see the different categories, 28% of this year's applicant pool is first generation, just, um, or I'm sorry, 20% increase in first generation applicants. So um, UCLA has been around for 100 years. We're just getting started. It's a, it's a global magnet for young, talented, high aspiration people around the world. It's an incredibly rich village to consider being a, a member of. And you know we're gonna tell you more about that tonight. So um, UCLA plus U, U plus the fifth largest alumni network in the United States. There are over 540,000 alumni of UCLA and 41,000 of those are Anderson alumni. So we are literally, you know, one of the top five, just in terms of mass, right? It's Penn State, Indiana, Michigan, Michigan State, us. Um, we are, you know, you're part of over half a million living alumni in California and 50 states and 100 countries around the world if you choose to be part of UCLA. It is one of the premier, one of the best known global university brands. And um, if you've traveled outside, I lived in, like I told you, Germany for three years. Um, with, with UCLA, I've, I've been to China, I've been to India with the school. And you know, when we, go to, when we go to our trips in China and India and you've got your UCLA gear, right? People come up to you, Yukla, Yukla, right? It's not even UCLA in most of the world. In most of the world, it's Yukla. It is a brand that makes people light up and smile. People have uncles and grandfathers and cousins. And, you know, it's, it is a place that attracts the hopes and dreams of talented people from around the world. We have over 125 different graduate programs of study at UCLA. And you get to be part of all of that if you choose to, if you choose to come to us. And this is uh, some more audience participation part. You get to say this, if you, if you get your Anderson MBA, you get to say, I'm a grad student at UCLA. You get to say, you know, just drop it into conversation. I'm getting my MBA at UCLA Anderson. So let's everybody practice. You don't have to, you can stay on mute, but um, just say it to yourself. Say it out loud. Nobody can hear you in your house, your apartment. Yeah, I'm a grad student at UCLA. Just practice that one. That's kind of rolls off the tongue. Or you see, I'm, I'm getting my MBA at UCLA Anderson. Just kind of practice saying it. You say it to the cat or the dog, all right? So, um, so I want to I want to hear from you right in the chat. One word. What's it feel like to say that, right? Like it's just you know, like what would it be like to go around your life next couple of years? Say it to your grandma. Say it to your parents. Say it to your roommates. Say it to your boss at work. Good, proud, awesome, empowering, great, amazing. Feels amazing. Yeah, yeah. You know, thank you. It's you know, like let's talk tonight about writing your future. You get to say you are the author of your life. And one thing you could do with your time and money is to go to grad school. And that is a big proactive step. And, you know, it's not just graduation. It's, it starts tonight. It starts when you're kicking the tires, when you're thinking about this deal. And even this spring, you may be applying to get an MBA, right? And you get to say that. You get to tell your boss, see, I'm applying to UCLA Anderson, right? You've got other wonderful school choices here in SoCal. I'm applying to get my MBA. Oh, tell me, what are you thinking about, right? You get to start those conversations. 
Um, totally awesome. It's UCLA. All right, Calissa, I like that. Very good. All right, you guys are going to keep this fun. So UCLA has been making history for 120, 120, 102 years. UCLA was founded in 1919. And we've made huge contributions in society, in research, and athletics. And so I want to give you a few of those, and then we'll be done with this first part of the evening. So, um, you know, I'll just start with some of the contributions we've made in society. It is February, it's Black History Month. Um, so I thought I'd pick a couple of big contributions that UCLA made in the arena of societal relations. You know, Jackie Robinson, everybody, if you saw the movie 42, Jackie Robinson graduated from UCLA in 1941. 1941, right? Right in the middle of World War II, big tumultuous time in America. He was the first person at UCLA to letter in four different collegiate sports, varsity sports. And he graduated as a four sport letterman in 1941, which was 24 years before the Civil Rights Act of 1965. And if you don't know your American history or your American sports history, he was the first African American in the major in the in the in baseball in the major leagues in baseball. At that time, it was a purely segregated world. There was a white league, there was a black league, and you couldn't cross. And he was the first person to do that. And to get a sense of what a big deal that was, I like to compare it to. Like who just won the Super Bowl? Yeah, Tom Brady, right? And uh, who won who won basketball last year? Yeah, the Los Angeles Lakers. How popular baseball was in America in the 40s is if you took modern day football, the Super Bowl, and you took the NBA, LeBron and everybody, if you put both of those popularities into one sport, that was baseball. And that was a segregated world. And that's the world that a UCLA Bruin stepped into and transformed the future of America, right? Because we get our signals from sports. We pay attention to sports. Sports is a big deal. And it was a huge first step. Somebody had to go first. And it was Jackie Robinson. And he did that 18 years. 1947, he joined the Brooklyn Dodgers 18 years before the civil rights legislation would be passed. So um, another example, Tom Bradley, class of 40, a year before Jackie Robinson, the first African-American mayor of Los Angeles, served for 20 years. He was the leader of our city from 1973 to 1993, including the first time, 1984, that we brought the Olympics to our town. A little more modern example, Ava DuVernay, uh, class of 95. You know, she doesn't just shine a light on history. She's making it, um, you know, from her breakthrough at Sundance in 2012 with her first work, Middle of Nowhere to Selma in 2014, to 13th in 2017, to When They See Us in 2019. You know, these are people who are proud emissaries, voices, representatives, leaders, optimists from the UCLA family, and they make a difference in society. You know, speaking of the Olympics, you know, LA, of course, we did it in 84. We're going to do it again in 2028. And UCLA, the campus, is going to be the center. It's going to be the athletic village. All of the Olympic and the Paralympic athletes are going to be living at UCLA that summer of 2028. I'm already telling my college friends from A&M, summer 2028, you got to be in my house. It's going to be an amazing world phenomenon, LA 2028. So those were some contributions UCLA in society. Now, if we look at UCLA in research, you know, this is the birthplace of the internet. October 29th, 1969, we just celebrated a 50 year mark recently. Dr. Leonard Kleinrock, shown in the picture here, sent the very first ARAPNET message, went from UCLA to Stanford. And if you know the answer, you can write it. If you don't know the answer, let's guess. What was the first word? What was the first word that was broadcast? The proto internet, the birth of the internet, 51 some odd years ago. What was the very first word that was broadcast on the internet? Go ahead and write it in the chat. Tell me what you think it was. Got to take a guess. No wrong answers. Hello, good, hello, hello. All right, we got a lot of, hi there. It was one word, one word. Hello, test, good, that would be good. Buffering, ah, Sidharth, we'll come back to you. Bruins, that would have been a good word. All right, any other guesses? 
Anybody? All right, Siddharth, Pathak, you win. Yes, it was low. Write it in the chat. The first internet message was low. It was supposed to be, no, it was not Trojans, Cynthia Somerville, I love you. It was not Trojans, it was not Go USC, it was not Fight On, it was low. And it was supposed to be login, but the system crashed. So when they interviewed um, Professor Kleinrock about it, he said, low, as in low and behold. He said, we didn't plan it, but it couldn't have been, we couldn't have come up with a better message. It was short and prophetic. So um, our current Dean, Tony Bernardo likes to say within one square mile, you know, within one square mile of Westwood, incredible history is being made all the time in the sciences, in the arts, UCLA is, is truly a global epicenter of thought leadership. So UCLA and research, one more example, Dr. Paul Tarasaki, if you don't know his story, incredibly inspiring story. He and his family, Japanese American, were interned in World War II, were placed in camps here in California based on their ethnicity and fear and what happens in wartime. He spent three years in a POW camp here, an internment camp during World War II. And he came out, he wasn't bitter, he got better, and he earned one, two, three degrees from UCLA, earning his doctorate. And he went on to be the pioneer in tissue typing. It was his cutting edge research that gave us the entire body of science that allows us to take an organ out of my body and put it in your body and your body can accept it. So Dr. Paul Tarasaki was the founder of the whole field that is today transplant medicine. He went on to be the founder of One Lambda, which went on to be a billion dollar company. And his family um, pays it forward uh, on Westwood Boulevard, just you know, a five minute walk from UCLA Anderson. The Tarasaki Research Institute continues his, his work in partnership with UCLA. So, um, Oh, one more. I'm sorry, I got a lot in the research department. We also just had our another Nobel Prize winner from UCLA just three months ago. Congratulations to Dr. Andrea Goetz, professor of physics and astronomy. There are 607 Nobel medals that have been awarded in scientific discipline. And prior to last fall, only 20 had gone to women. So uh, Dr. Goetz is the 21st female uh, to win the Nobel Prize in a scientific discipline. And she won that for physics. So I've talked about UCLA and society. I've talked about UCLA and research, a couple more UCLA and athletics. And these examples are a little closer to home. This is uh, very own FEMBA, um, Ed Moses, class of 2016. He's FEMBA's second ever Olympic gold medalist. This, uh, this icon here, this is our podcast icon. So I'm gonna mention people that you can listen to later. So if you'd like to hear um, Ed's story about why he chose Anderson and what he, he chose to do with it, um, I'll give you that link at the end of tonight. Um, his was my very first podcast interview. And uh, I probably should have started with someone a little easier, but um, he's a great guy, high, high energy human being. And he was a graduate a couple years ago. Um, throw up another gold medalist, Susan Francia. She's our third gold medalist and uh, she's class of 2018. I recorded her interview right before COVID last year. She drove up from San Diego she is working in biotech and, uh, and is actually working on the COVID vaccine. She's got a killer story about meeting Kobe Bryant. Um, she went to Penn undergrad and he's from Philadelphia originally. And we recorded this, unfortunately, right after the tragic loss of his life. And she was reflecting on that because they were both from the Philadelphia area. And she's got a killer story about meeting him and Dwight Howard at the Olympics and, uh, and how he actually became a mentor to her uh, and, and gave her some really wonderful pointers about how to deal with fame after she won her gold medal and really became a, a public persona. So it's a, it's a great story listening to Susan. Her story is amazing. Her parents fled Hungary. Her mother was a PhD in the sciences and they actually fled Hungary with their, their life savings sewn into the teddy bear that, she was, that was with her. She was just a little baby on the plane. And uh, she tells a great story about that. Just an incredible example, another example of America at its best. Um, and our, oh, I, I said we, we have those two gold medalists. The first FEMBA gold medalist is actually Mitch Kupchak. So the former general manager of the Lakers, he went 
to what was called the X program. It was the prototype that became the fully employed MBA program. But we, we claim him as our own because he was working full time while he got his MBA. So, um, but uh, I'll give you the link later for Susan's Drive Time podcast. And lastly, we have to talk about our famous coach, John Wooden. Um, make today your masterpiece, the quote I had on the very first slide. Uh, coach Wooden is a legend above and beyond, above and beyond Los Angeles and above and beyond basketball. Uh, he won 10 NAACP, NAACP, I'm thinking Black History Month, 10 NCAA championships um, in his time here at UCLA. But more importantly than his victories on the court, he has a whole body of thought about how to, how to be a good person, how to do the right thing when nobody is looking. And if you don't know about Coach Wooden, when you, um, when you come to UCLA, you will learn about this great, great part of, of UCLA culture and American culture and sports culture. Just a great guy. So the point of this first part, UCLA has made history its first 102 years. That's one point. We are um, in the global top 20 universities. There's only two that are less than 100 years old or at 100 years. And it's, it's two from the University of California, UCLA and UC Berkeley. Um, you know, we're up there with Cambridge and Oxford and, and, you know, organizations that have earned around 500, 700 years. And here in America with Harvard and MIT, these are incredible bastions of learning and, and possibility and optimism, these, these institutions. So UCLA is a, is a global destination for your hopes and dreams. So that's one point. The second point is that you can trust us for the next 102 years, right? We're just getting started. Look at those applications to our freshmen entering class, right? Organizations are only as great as the people who are next in line to come be part of the organization. And we continue to attract the best and brightest people at the undergraduate and the graduate level from around the world. So you can trust us with your hopes and dreams. You can put UCLA on your resume. You can put a graduate degree into your skill set, and you can rewrite the narrative from good to great. You already got a good life and we're going to make it great. That's the point we want to talk about tonight. So UCLA plus you equals your story only better. Okay. Right? If you knew how to get there already, you wouldn't need us because you'd already be getting there on your own. But if you're looking at your life saying, you know, I think there's more that I'm capable of, you plus UCLA is a bigger version of you. That's the narrative that you can write for yourself. And that's what we're talking about tonight. So this is your one and only wild and precious life. If you know that poem by Mary Oliver, the poet, tell me, what is it? you would like to do with your one and only wild and precious life. If you surround yourself with excellence, you get to write your best story. So I wanna show you some of the excellence of UCLA. That's been this first part of the evening. Now I wanna switch gears and start talking about the excellence of the fully employed MBA program and how that can match the excellence of you and how that can give you a chapter for these next couple of years that could really transform the next decades of your life. So we'll move on to this next section here. So why FEMBA? You plus UCLA. The first part was UCLA plus you, but now let's flip it. Now let's talk about you and what can UCLA Anderson and what can the Fully Employed MBA program do for you? So ask yourself, do you like, do you like these things? Do you like your job? Are you still learning, right? Is it a job that's fun to go to? Is it a job that you had to work hard to get? You know, just look for yourself. I'm not going to, you know, you don't have to answer this one in the chat. So that's the first question. Do I like my job? Do I like the people here? Do I like the environment? Is this an interesting industry? Am I learning? Am I growing? Sure, you can like the paycheck or things like that. But do I just like my job? Excuse me, those are my docs. Do you like your boss? That's the second question, right? Do you have a good boss? My wife always tells me, my wife is a former human resources director. And she said, people don't quit jobs, people quit bosses, right? People quit bosses. Do you like your boss? Is that man or woman, are they supportive of you? Do they know your name? Do they like you? Do they want you to grow and develop, right? So that's the second question. And then third one, do you like results in real time? Right, that's the beauty of FEMBA. You can take class on Tuesday night. You could be in class right now on Tuesday night. There are a lot of FEMBAs taking class right now. They will take what they learned tonight and they will raise their hand in a staff meeting tomorrow on Wednesday, 
right? And they will have something to say based on what they learned tonight. So if you want to keep the job, keep the boss, get the results in real time, then FEMBA is for you. And FEMBA may not be for you. You may want to do a full-time MBA program. You may want to get a degree in public policy or go be a lawyer, be a doctor. We don't know. But what we're telling you about tonight are the opportunities around getting a master in business, a master degree in business administration, and getting it in the fully employed MBA program where you keep your job while you go to school. So this is a big investment, right? This is a huge investment of time, money, effort. That's the input. It's 20 hours a week, plus or minus for 27 months. Once school starts, right? Not counting the six months right now before school starts. It's $130,000. It's about $40,000 a year, a little bit more. And it's effort. You got to do the work. You got to go to class. You got to be on the group calls. You got projects, homework, midterms, tests, right? Nobody's going to do it for you. This is graduate school. Our dean loves to say it's supposed to be rigorous. It's not undergrad. This is to master a domain. Undergrad, you learn a bunch of stuff. In a graduate program, you master something. You become master of your domain. This is the terminal degree in business. There's doctorates in business, but they're not really a real, they're not what people do who wanna go run businesses. What people do who wanna run businesses is they get a master's in business. And that's what this is. So that's the input. That's this left column over here. But over here, what that input leads to is this output. You get a world-class education. Your gray matter is going to get better. You will be able to think more crisply, more clearly. You'll be able to articulate complex arguments and win those arguments. You will get a master's degree in business administration. And you will get an experience. There's something about earning an MBA that can't be gotten any other way. You either do this or you don't do this. And in the process of doing this, it's, it's a bell you cannot unring. You will have the experience of having gone to one of the premier universities on the planet and earned a master's in business administration. And you will walk out of here with an incredible network. And I'm gonna give you a couple examples of that tonight, a little later. I'm gonna play you part of a Drive Time podcast, which is an incredible little three minute snippet from our most recent episode, where you really hear how this guy landed an incredible internship at Paradigm Sports, one of the premier sports agencies. And he got that through the network here at UCLA. So this is a big investment. Time, money, effort is the input leading to education, experience, and the network is the output. So why should you make a big investment in you? You, yeah, you there in your apartment. Why should you make this investment in you? All right, so let's write in the chat. Give me some, give me some answers. Why should you make an investment in you? This one could be more than one word. Tell me what you think. I may call on some people too, because I'm worth it. I like that. Growth, growth, because I'm worth it. Let's see, where's Caleb? Caleb, can you share? Can you unmute and talk to me? I have a conversation here. You may not be free to talk, but if you are, can you, see, can you see me? Ah, there we go. All right, Caleb, thank you for letting me cold call you. This is just like school. So do, what do you do, Caleb? Where, where are you? What do you do? Um, I'm based out of Brentwood. I'm currently in commercial real estate brokerage. Um, I've been looking at the FEMBA program for a few months now to uh, and learn the quant to uh, work my way into uh, development. Very nice. Thank you for letting me call on you. So you like your job. You got a good boss. You, you still in a growth mode? I'm in a growth mode. I'm just seeing, uh, I guess, like what probably a lot of people hear is that that roadblock of you can only go so far um, with your bachelor's degree. And I've realized a lot of the companies I want to work for um, either go to Marshall or Anderson for their master's of business. So that's why I'm here. Fantastic. Well, that's, you know, the, you know, it's like you can you can be supported in a company and you can do, you know, licenses and certificates and ongoing education. And that's great. 
And if you've got an industry or a boss or a situation where they're supporting you, that's fantastic. You know, the thing about an MBA is it's, it's that plus a lot more because it really is your head, your heart, your gut. You know, it is a, it's cross training for your entire future executive. I love to say you're CEO of your own life, you know, and here I am, I'm Caleb. I got a foot in the door in Brentwood. I'm in the, I'm in the biz and I'm noticing that people around me, they go to USC, they go to Marshall, they go to Anderson, right? What about my quant? You know, how can I really become the total triple threat, right? So that I can own the room when I walk in. And if you, if you, Caleb, make that investment in you, you, Caleb, right? Nobody can ever take that away from you. You know, that's the thing. If we wait for somebody to kind of discover us, oh, Dylan, you have great potential. Yeah, you know, maybe they see it, maybe they don't. If you ever get a boss who really sees your potential, you know, hold on to that boss because it's hard to be that kind of boss. The world moves so quickly. You know, half the bosses in the world, they're still trying to keep their own darn job, let alone grow you, right? But you, you look at you in the morning every morning, right? Only Caleb knows what really is going to make Caleb's life sing. And that's for all of us here, right? These are great answers. The best ROI I can get is to invest in myself, to challenge myself. I'm the best asset that I know to help myself and others. Make me a better person. Push me to take calculated risk. Take my startup to the next level. All right, Kat, we love that. For all the good I can do, Gareth, I love that. Opportunity, Tiffany, Samra, challenge. For a career, not a job. Yeah, I'm going to show you some really fancy graphs here in a minute. <laughs> They're not that fancy. But I love the idea of, of a career, not a job. So that's what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about you investing in you. And that's the point of this evening. You know, if you take the time to invest in you, it's it's like it's got to start somewhere, right? It Success begets success. When I recognize that there's potential excellence in me and I put time and money against that, other people see that. Wow, that person respects themselves. Wow, that person's going places. Wow, that person's got an upward trajectory. That person's not just sitting around eating potato chips. That person's challenging themselves on on purpose. And that kind of energy attracts more of the same, right? You hang around people who are drifting upward and you go upward with them. You know, they're like they're like eagles soaring on a thermal, right? You hang around people who are sitting on the couch eating potato chips, waiting for something to happen, right? Like we get to say, we get to choose who we spend our time with, what books we read, what conversations we participate in. And if you choose to go to graduate school at UCLA, you're surrounding yourself with incredible people, reading incredible books and articles, and, and you're surrounding yourself with people who are who are high aspiration, where could I go? And it's contagious. So, and those of you here tonight, I don't know how many people we got, I don't know where it went, like 50 people, right? You're here, it's a Tuesday night, you could be watching basketball, you could be watching Netflix, you could be doing the COVID veg out, whatever. But you're here, you know, you're educated, you're employed, you're part of the part of America that is on the court making stuff happen. You're already successful. Right? So, and I, I took out loans for undergrad. Now you're gonna ask me to finance a $130,000 graduate degree. Oh, blah, I'm already gonna make it. Do I really need this? So this next chart is for you. So this is my fancy chart. I wanna minimize this over here. So this is you without UCLA. Here we are, 2021. And look at these increments. These are decade long increments. Caleb's going. 2081, what are you, Caleb? You look like you're a nice 30-year-old-ish, something like that. Now this guy's 29. 29, right? This guy's talking about 2081. Oh my God. 39, 49, 59, 69, 79, 89. I don't want to think about being 89 years old, right? Except here's the deal, man. We're all going to live to be like 110, right? If you halfway take care of yourself, the advances in science, we're all going to live a long time, way longer than our grandparents, way longer than our great grandparents. That's available. And here I'm saying, you know, Caleb is a smart, good looking, hardworking dude. He's got a foothold in Brentwood. He's going to figure it out even without UCLA. So this is, this is the pre, 
This is the no UCLA graph. So hang on tight, pay attention. If you're drifting, if you're distracted, turn off your phone because I'm about to give you a really fancy upgrade to this graph. This is you, successful without UCLA. One, two, three, ready for it? Here it comes. And this is you with UCLA. Look at that. Isn't that incredible? Those are some high-tech graphics. I built those myself this morning. <laughs> Reviewing, that's you without UCLA, good life. This is you with UCLA. That's what we're talking about, that delta, right? We wanna get you around people who are aiming at something higher than what you know how to aim at on your own. And I'm going to make a suggestion tonight that your trajectory is more important than your position. Because you ever notice that sometimes you're just kind of up, like you're having a good month, right? Yeah, I'm up. And then some night, some months, it's like, wow, the world's on top of my head, right? I mean, life does that. There are these little peaks and valleys all the time. That's just life. That's always going to happen. But my trajectory, what am I aiming at? Am I willing to have positive self-talk and then surround myself with people who are going to amplify and nurture and expand and harmonize with that positive self-talk? That is a change of trajectory. That's what we were doing a few minutes ago. I'm getting my MBA at UCLA. Yeah, I'm working. I mean, I'm going to grad school at UCLA Anderson. That's what I want you envisioning tonight for yourself. That's you plus UCLA. Hey, Christian, buddy, can you go in that room, buddy? Um, we're just sharing space here. It's all good. So our tagline, think in the next. We, you know, probably about to get a new tagline soon, but about 10 years ago, we had our board of advisors, our faculty, the business community, Ogilvy. We did an 18 month review of, of the stakeholders of UCLA, the faculty, the staff, the students, the alumni, our friends in the business community. And we came up with this as a, as, a, as a phrase that captures who are we, what are we as a West Coast school, as a cutting edge, you know, Southern California, Silicon Beach, the high tech, nanotech from San Diego, real estate, entertainment, you know, this media epicenter. What are we? We're an we're a organization at the edge. We're at the edge of America. We're Latin facing. We're Pacific Rim facing. We're at this merger of technology and media and communication. And so we came up with this phrase for ourselves: think in the next. And we have these three pillars that support think in the next. And they are think fearlessly, share success, drive change. And I love these pillars. I love to think head, heart, gut, right? Think fearlessly. I'm gonna to go to grad school such that I can really train myself to do critical business thinking and articulate arguments that are compelling, where people want to give me money and give me time and give me resources and give me green lights, where I can make stuff happen in the world. So that's going to change my head. But everybody knows it's who you know, right? And we have this collaborative culture. Our old dean, Judy Olian, she used to say, we're not sharp elbows and pointy knees. We are a we culture. I don't win at the expense of you. I win and then I reach and I pull you up and we share success. And I'm gonna, when I play this clip a little while of, of our drive time with Derek, you're gonna hear exactly how his classmates helped him get that internship. And that's our heart, right? Who do you know? These, these acquaintances become friendships and these friendships become deep friendships. And what is a person that I'm just in class with becomes a person that I go through life with in my professional, even in my personal. You know, people become friends here and those friendships last. So your head, you get smarter, your heart grows a size bigger, you build your network. And then there's this experience, you do the work to earn an MBA at UCLA. And there's an X factor of confidence that's with you for the rest of your career. And we call that drive change. Because you can be the smartest guy in the room and you can be the best networked guy in the room, but if you don't raise your hand, if you don't have the confidence to say, hey world, I've got an idea about that, your life doesn't change, your career doesn't change. So those are our pil pillars. Think fearlessly, share success, drive change. So let's talk about the first one. Let's say you're gonna be smarter. And then let's talk about the second one. You're gonna share success, you're gonna be better networked. And then we'll talk about 
the third one, you're going to drive change. You're going to be more confident. So let's look at those. So which would you rather be? Let's get a little sense of our audience here. Smarter, networked, confident. Just smart, networked, confident. What do you want? What do you want out of this deal? Let's see. Let's see what you say right into the chat. Smarter, networked, networked, confident, smarter, smarter, networked, confident, network, 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 confident, network, network. All right, smarter. All right. I love it. I love it. I love it. Right. And you know what? You know the punchline. Of course, you know the punchline. I'm. What am I going to tell you? What am I going to tell you? What's the punchline? Somebody write it in there. Can you only get one of these three? No, I'm going to say you can get all three. I'm going to say that's what you pay for, right? That's what you get to take away. Yes, you'll be able to talk, think, look, act, sound like an MBA. Yes, you'll know a bunch of people. And yes, you'll have the confidence to raise your hand. You get to do all three. But let's just look at them one by one. Think fearlessly, smarter. All right, what's a good raise? Throw me some numbers in there. What's a good raise, all right? Just do it as a percent. You can do absolute numbers. You can do it as a percent. I think it'll work better if we do percent. 20%. That's a good raise. I like that. Gareth, 25%. 15 to 25%. 20%. 30 to 40%. Yeah, those are good raises. Yeah, 20%. What was your last raise? Was it like those? If it was, I maybe want to come work for you. Yeah. yeah. Think about the last raise you got. Think about where things are in your industry right now. Some people, some industries are on fire. You work for Amazon, there's more work than you can do, right? Well, um, for our 2019 graduates, two years ago, we, uh, we did a very thorough survey. We'd never done it before. And God bless our career services team. They tracked down, uh, they, they wanted to have a 75% response rate, which if you know anything about surveys, that's a really high response rate. So it wasn't really a survey. They literally just tracked people down. They watched them on LinkedIn. You know, this was the class of 2019 and um, and they tracked and, and it was almost like a full time job for Brianna on the team, plus the, the career directors. And they found that 75% um, of the class of 2019 survey, they stopped when they got to 75% because that was a high, high response rate, that the average salary had gone up 49% during the three years of FEMBA. We had never tracked this number before. This was a brand new number for us. And honestly, we were a little bit gun shy because we'd always thought that our, we'd had some maybe less rigorous surveys and our number had always been about 25 to 35%. During the three years of FEMBA, people's salary would bump up 25 to 35%. And we thought that was pretty good. So when we got 49%, we said, well, let's not, let's not talk about that too much because maybe that was an aberration. So of course we went ahead last year and then it was COVID and we had no idea what we were gonna get. And it went up even more. For the class of 2020, the people who graduated during COVID, the average salary, 75% responding, had gone up 55%. Their salary walking in the door, I think the average salary for that class three years ago had been about, I think it was like 89,000, something like that. And it had gone up 55%. It gone up to about 138, whatever, 138, 139,000. And we have a wide range, right? We have people who make less money. We have people who make more money. But that was the average percent jump for the class of 2020. So you kind of look at your life like, oh, they're going to ask a lot of money. Graduate school is expensive. Now you can take loans, right? There are ways to pay for it. But look what it's going to do. And you got to think about it. If you're making 50% more three years later, you're probably, you know, you're probably not doing the same thing. You've reinvented yourself, probably. You've probably had one, maybe two promotions. You maybe went and worked for a competitor. You may be doing something totally new and different. All of that is possible. So take out your phone, calculate your 49 to 55% raise. All right, let's just do the big one. You know, this is not a promise. You know, you can't come and sue me if this doesn't happen for you, but this happened for 75% of the people the last two years, right? That's a pretty sizable success rate. You won't get these kind of odds in Vegas, right? So you take your salary now, 2021, then you look forward three years, 2024, 20, you actually get done December of 23 because we've shortened the program. It's 27 months now instead of 33. So take your salary, multiply it by 1.55. And then ask yourself, am I going to get there without this? Or could this be the kick in the pants that I need? 
to help me really write my future. Here's another one. This is a one-time data point. Business Week, Bloomberg Business Week back in 2015, they did a, a five to eight year after graduation survey. So they asked us for our alumni lists and then they did, they had a, they hired an agency and they went and, aver they went and surveyed graduates five to eight years prior. And there they found out that the, for UCLA Anderson for the fully employed MBA program, five to eight years after graduation, salaries had bumped up 137% from where they were before the MBA. So if you want to calculate your 137% raise, <laughs> take your salary now and multiply it by 2.37. So if you walk in the door of FEMBA making $100,000 a year, what we from this one data point saw that happened would, you know, you'd be making about 237,000 a year, five or eight years later. So from the time you start to the time you graduate, right? Eight to 11 years. So it's a decade. So that's, that's pretty, it's not outside the realm of possibility, right? But it means you're going to go from being an individual contributor to a manager, from a manager to a director, from a director to a VP. You're going to be taking those stair steps up in your career. And we're going to help accelerate that process. So better than return on investment, you're also going to give yourself that new trajectory that I showed on the other one. But, you know, I'm going to talk about some other stuff, you know, sharing success and driving change. But, you know, people want to know this is a this is a for profit master's degree. This is a degree to run a modern organization, to be able to deal with complexity, deal with people, process, technology, disruptions, pandemics, global supply chains. This is a degree to deal with the bigness of modern life and to deal with it effectively. And there's not a lot of people out there who know how to deal with modern life effectively. But MBAs from UCLA are people who can do that. And yes, it will pay for itself. But more importantly, I'm going to suggest it's that trajectory idea that if you can take a good life and aim it just one degree higher and stay on that trajectory over time, you open up incredible worlds for yourself. So that was uh, that was about the thinking fearlessly and the return on investment. So let me give you a couple of examples of sharing success in the network aspect, because that's a huge part of an MBA. Probably no master's degree focuses on networking more than MBAs. It's really part and parcel to the worldview of an MBA student body. So I love this question. You probably, you guys are pretty smart so far, so you probably know the answer to this. Um, when is the best time to look for a job? Tell me in the chat. Yeah, yeah, when you already have one, when you are employed. Now, what's the second question that goes with that? The best time to look for a job is when you have a job, that's the answer. But what's the question that follows that? Why is the best time to look for a job while you have a job? Leverage. All right, Gareth, you've been giving me a lot of good information. Let's talk with you. Gareth, can you can you come online? Are you free to talk? You may not be. If you're not, it's fine. I'll call somebody else. But if you're free, let me get to meet Gareth. Um, hey, thank you. Thank you. So so tell me, what do you mean, leverage? Tell me some more about that. Well, you have some bargaining power. If you're already employed, you don't need it. You can use that to your advantage. 100%. 100%, right? Like what's going to happen in FEMBA if you choose to come here? 100% of the people who start FEMBA have a job that's worth keeping. And that is a big deal, right? 100% of my classmates at Chicago, we 100% had a job that was worth quitting. <laughs> and uh, you're going to get hired by your classmates if you choose to come to a fully employed MBA program. You know, there's going to be a person in your study group and they're going to say, hey, am I pronouncing it right? Is it Garrett or Gareth? Uh, with a th gareth you know gareth hey let me let me take your let me take your resume to my hr director and what, what do you do gareth where do you work i work at uh, lpl financial i'm a trading consultant yeah so you know gareth's gonna be like hey buddy thank you i'm so flattered that you think of me but you know i'm at lpl financial i'm a trading consultant i got a good gig and then your classmate your friend you know your acquaintance becoming a friend is gonna say gareth look 
look, just do me a solid. Yes, there's a finder's fee, but even if just, look, I'll just look good if you just, let me just introduce you because it'll look like I care about the company. And Gareth, you'd be like, all right, let me do you a solid. And then you get to meet the HR director and they're giving you their sales pitch and you're, you know, I'm Gareth, I'm tall, I'm awesome. I've got a good deal going here at LPL, right? Like, I'm, honestly, I'm, I'm really flattered that you guys think of me. I'm, I'm so happy at LPL. I don't want to waste your time, but, you know, my buddy said you were looking and, you know, I always try to stay open to new opportunities. So, but I don't want to set, you know, the expectations wrong. So now Gareth has just dropped, uh, you've just dropped the gauntlet in front of that HR director. Now you, that's like red meat for an HR director because now they got to woo you, <laughs> right? Yeah. And you are in the leverage position. You are in the driver's seat. Right. Well, what would it take you? What would it what would it take you to get what would it take to get you to consider something beyond LPL? Because we really got a pretty cool boutique going here. You may not have heard of us yet. We're small, we're hungry, but we got resources, we got good backers, we got stability, and we got we got a we got a playground here. We're doing some cool stuff. And I think if you saw our, our new technology suite and you saw our portfolio and you saw our support. You know, like our our people are 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 on the court. We 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 got 80% productive hours. People are making money with us, and I'm sure LPL is treating you right. Right now, Gareth is getting the sales pitch, and you're in the driver's seat. Right, you get to be coy. Um, could you guys close the door, please? Um, so definitely where you want to be. Yeah, it's where you want to be, and that's what comes with being in a fully employed MBA pathway. Now, I loved my Chicago time. It did great things for me. It challenged me, it grew me, you know, it was awesome. But none of my classmates were gonna give me a job. Everybody used to have a job. <laughs> Everybody's sitting around talking about how they used to be, <laughs> right? You know, it's fun to still have a salary, right? It's fun to be a full-time grad student, but trust me, when you're in a full-time program, we spent a lot of time talking about getting an internship for that first summer. And we spent a lot of time. I used to wonder, are we learning anything? Because all we did was talk about getting a job, right? It's a very different headspace to be in a full-time student body was my human personal experience. And then I've watched it, right? So this dynamic of sharing success is part and parcel to the fully employed MBA program. And it's the dynamic Gareth and I have been talking about. So 100%, of FEMBA start with a job that is too good to quit, right? That's what makes a FEMBA program a FEMBA program. I mean, and your job may not be, it may not love it, but it's still more positive than not. You know, it's not the perfect job, but you know, I'm still learning here. I think there's potential here. I worked hard to get here and I want the MBA. I want the education. I want the experience. I want the network. So FEMBAs hire each other. You know, these are these are companies that are students. We have 900 students. We admit about 300 students a year on average. It went high last year. We had a big COVID boom. But normally we admit 275 to 300 students a year. And they work for these big name brand companies, right? Accenture, B of A, Baxter, Boeing. Boeing's our lifetime number one employer. Google, Intel, Disney's a top five. Northrop's a top five. Qualcomm's a top five. We get the great McMaster car folks. Um, we got a lot of people from Sony. A lot of people from the military, a lot of people from UCLA and, you know, MGM and, and Warner Brothers and, and entertainment. Um, but 90% of people in LA County work for a company with less than 100 people. So there will be a lot of your classmates who are the only person from their company. And there'll be these little cool boutiques that you've never even heard of and that you probably never would have heard of had you not come to UCLA. And you'll hire each other. You know, this is, if you guys know League of Legends and you know Riot Games over in Santa Monica, this is a great story. Uh, a guy named John was at Boeing, you know, mechanical engineer, been at Boeing seven years, just getting his MBA to kind of move up the ranks, going to be a Boeing lifer. And like I said, Boeing's our number one lifetime employer. We, you know, we have a great relationship with Boeing. So this is nothing about Boeing. This is just about what can happen. Well, he had, a, he had one of his group mates first year was working over, you know, Riot Games. Totally different environment than Boeing. Boeing is like, you know, government secret clearance, you know, you're building satellites that got to go up in space and come back down, airplanes. And, you know, he's like, I don't think I'd fit. He's like, ah, try it out. Same deal. You know, HR director, we're looking for, you know, we want to bring some people with quant skills. And he went over, listened, heard the 
pitch and said, ah, I'm young, let's try something. And spent the second two years of, of the fully employed MBA program working at Riot. So we went from really kind of buttoned up, you know, corporate 50 Boeing corporate culture to cats on skateboards, people coming, working 12 hour days, you know, coffee machine, the whole kind of Silicon Valley deal. And, and he loved it. And then at the end of FEMBA, he left Riot and went on to a third destination. So here's a guy who walked into FEMBA thinking he was going to be a Boeing lifer, and then he just reinvented his whole narrative. So here's, um, here's one, uh, and, and he did it by getting hired by a classmate. So here's one, um, and I'm going to kind of speed up a little bit now because I want to leave some time for questions. But this is Brian Thomas. Uh, he's the co-founder of a company. Brian's the guy by the, the door down low. He co-founded Clutter with his partner here. Uh, by the time he left active ownership, uh, he'd gone from nothing to a hundred million dollar VC funded going concern. Every time they, it's a, it's a modern technology solution for storage. Instead of you going to the scary, instead of you going to the scary um, self-storage unit, they come to your house, pick up all your stuff, take pictures of it. You get a website with all your stuff. You can, oh, I want to, I want that lamp back. They'll pull it out of storage, bring it back to you. Totally cool um, technology solution. We got a podcast. I'll give you the link at that. Every time they opened up a new city, he'd hire two MBAs, a director of operations and a director of marketing. You know, he's he was writing this business plan while he was at FEMBA, taking it to Professor Scheinrock, who runs our field study program. He said, you know, Professor Scheinrock, do you think this idea has got any, any life? And Scheinrock said, I think you got a puncher's chance. And that's all that Brian needed. You know, entrepreneurs are very crazy people. They are very unreasonable. All he needed was one, one person he trusted and said, yeah, you got a puncher's chance. You might hit it. And he totally hit it. You can hear his story on that podcast. So a um, couple other things, and then, and then we're going to get to the Q&A. Some of you are married. About a third of our students are married. You might be wondering, oh, can I do this and be married? Got a couple of podcasts from some of our married students. Uh, Nassim here, um, she was the chief quality officer at UCLA Health. She's a medical doctor went on to get her, her MBA. She's now, uh, I think, down at U, UC Irvine, got a big promotion down there. She was the mother of two while she did the program. Mark Lee is an entertainment entrepreneur. He, um, his podcast talks about, you know, just working it out, managing a family. So you can totally do FEMBA if you've got, if you've got a husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, if you have children, we have lots of students with kids. Um, if one third of our students are married, process of deduction. Two thirds of our students are uh, single. What's the number one factor of who you will marry? We'll get this one. This is a fun chat question. Oh, I, I see Naren. I see you asking me questions. I can't answer private questions right now. Just uh, save those for Q&A at the end and I'll be happy to answer those about employers and sustainability. But right now the question is, what is the number one factor in who you will marry? And this is not, you know, you can be same sex, heterosexual. It's not about it, that. It's just about a life partner. Shared experiences, Freudism, <laughs> these are good ones. Gareth, Gareth, you've seen my presentation before. You're so brilliant. Education level, Santiago, thank you. You know, and this, this may have changed with the internet. Mutual interests and communications. These are all great. These are all great. In my sociology class back at Texas A&M, they said, you know, when they did the studies, proximity, you know, you end up marrying someone that you're around. <laughs> all that other stuff, race, religion, ethnicity, all that good stuff. You know, that's all great, but you, you, you end up a life partner with someone that you are around. So that begs the question of, you know, who am I around, right? If you're single, this is a great place to be. You know, whatever flavor you want, tall, short, man, woman, non-binary, we got everything at UCLA, anything you could ever want. And it's a great place. And if you want to catch a fish, go where the fish are. Right? We have this incredible gym called the Wooden Center, way cheaper than Equinox. It's, it's a five minute walk from Anderson. And once we're post COVID, it's a great place to go. You put on your UCLA Anderson t-shirt, you go work out, make eye contact, take the headphones out, right? There are 125 other graduate programs at UCLA. Anderson is, is one of eight professional programs and 125 different graduate degrees plus some of the smartest undergrads on the planet. So this is a place where you can spend time, right? You can spend a little or a lot. And if you spend a lot, you're gonna make great friendships that could lead to business partnerships, that could lead to life partnerships. 
I'm not, I'm not silly about this. If you want to surround yourself with great people, go where the great people are. And UCLA is that kind of place. So lastly, drive change, confidence. Confidence is a big deal. We all need confidence. Like I said, you could be the smartest person in the room, have the best network, but if you don't raise your hand, your career doesn't change. So um, one, more, one more question. What do alumni miss most? What do FEMBA alumni in particular miss most after they graduate? Put it in the chat. What do our alumni miss most? The people, the community, the peers. Yeah, you guys are getting my vibe. They're classmates. That is exactly right. That is exactly right. They miss each other. You know, having some really cool friends that you get to talk with week in and week out. What's your life about? How's your job? How's your boss? Did you get that promotion? Are you gonna Are you gonna take that leap? Are you gonna leave? Are you gonna go to that other deal? How's your boyfriend? How's your girlfriend? How are your kids? Right? You get into a rhythm with these folks and it's contagious and it's amazing. So handshakes to hugs, that's one of our taglines. You know, you start making handshakes and by the time you get to commencement, you're given hugs. And these are people you got through school with, but these are people you're gonna go through the next decades with. FEMBA equals support. We graduate almost every single person who starts the program. If you get through the fall quarter, chances are you're gonna graduate. Super supportive faculty, super supportive staff, super supportive classmates, super supportive career center. You know, we're gonna get you through it. Remember, would you rather be smarter, better networked, or more confident? I already gave you the answer. You know, you can be all three. And what's my evidence that you can think fearlessly, share success and drive change? I've got over 60 long form interviews with alumni and students sharing their success stories. We call it UCLA Drive Time. I'm the host, I've been doing it for about five years. I got, I kind of quit doing it in 18 and 19, but I got started again last year, put everything on YouTube last year, did about half of them in my office and then COVID came. Now we do them on Zoom. And um, I'm gonna give you the, the link at the end, but the real stories of people in the program or recent graduates who think fearlessly share success and drive change. And I want you to listen to some of those, it'll help, right? Here's some of the ones we did last summer. Uh, Sophie, Dominique, Rob, and Tina, they graduated last year. They were nominated by their peers. Sophie and Tina are at Amazon. Rob was a Marine who's now uh, an investment banker for Barclays. Dominique is a single mother of two. She commuted from Bakersfield. She has a PhD and uh, she works in um, either Genentech, she works in biotech. Uh, Brittany Blackamore graduated in 2016. She's got an incredible story. Uh, she's now a management consultant. Um, her story is just incredible. She really found herself while she was here on our global immersions that we do. Kate Greenberg is a UCLA love story. She graduated in 2010. She made, met her husband in undergrad at UCLA. He put her through FEMBA. She put him through UCLA law. And they've gone from Los Angeles to Miami to Manhattan. And now they're in DC. And she's the chief marketing officer for the Washington Nationals Philanthropies. So uh, these are all people that would be in your future alumni network. And um, right now I'm gonna play you a little excerpt. So our newest drive time in honor of Black History Month, I had the honor to interview Jermaine Sherman, Jairo Mateo and Derek Cox. And I interviewed them about 10 days ago and we released it this weekend. And I just wanna share with you, it's about three minutes long and then we'll get to the Q and A. But uh, the person in the bottom right here is Derek Cox. Before FEMBA, Derek played seven seasons in the NFL. Um, he has the distinction, he intercepted, he was a cornerback. He intercepted both Peyton Manning and Tom Brady during his NFL career. But what he's gonna tell you right now is he's gonna tell you a three minute sharing success story about what happened to him in one of his classes when a classmate called him with an opportunity. So give me just a second. I am going to do a new share. Oh, let's see, how do I do this? Give me just a second. I know, thank you, buddy. My IT, my eight year old IT consultant is reminding me there's a share button. Thank you, Christian. All right, thank you, friend. I'm gonna figure it out. Daddy will remember it here. Okay, here we go. All right, so we're gonna play this. Oh, and I gotta put the other. All right. Uh, I was, this was in the fall, this was just recent. Uh, this, this was in the, back in the fall. And, you know, I had a conversation, you probably know the name Richie Chang. Oh, yeah. 
everybody knows Richie. So Mr. Networker. <laughs> right. And so, you know, Richie, me and him were just talking about what I'm trying to do and what I'm getting in, getting into. And, you know, Richie was like, you know, I see you have the, the, the football experience. So there's probably ability, yeah, for you to be an agent, but do you have the agent experience? And I was like, nah, I don't. And he was like, okay, you know, that's what you have to work on getting is the agent experience. And, you know, from him making that statement, not long after that, maybe, maybe two weeks, I'm not even sure, but another one of my classmates is in a Zoom meeting and it's for the Sports Business Association. And he's, and he's like, he asked me, he said, you know, hey, where are you at? You should be in this meeting. And I was like, I was like, no, I didn't know about it. And he was like, yeah, man, we're, we're, we're interviewing uh, this, this agent, Audio Tar. And he used to be a UCLA student. And he said, you know, uh, I'm gonna make sure, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna copy, I'm gonna record a video and I'm gonna send it to you and you need to watch it. And he was like, and they also, they have an internship. You need, definitely, he sends it over to me. And this is out of nowhere, like, and, 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 you know, the buddy that sent it to me, he's, he's a part of my FIMBA 2021 class. We're in the same, uh, you know, the same group. And, but, but it's not as if, you know, we, we, we've been hanging out on the weekends. We talk regularly, you know, it was just, it was really like, this was out of the blue. And he, and he's like, you need to see this uh, and you need to watch it. And you need to apply for the internship. And so I said, okay, cool. So I, I do everything, watch it, apply for the internship. He's like, don't just apply. He was like, he was like, you need to hit up the head agent too on, on, on LinkedIn, send him a message. So I do that as well. And all in all, what happens is I land an internship with Paradigm Sports Agency. And, um, you know, this sports agency, if you're familiar with combat fighting, they represent their biggest client is Conor McGregor. And so, you know, just having that experience on the resume for me is like, wow, that's tremendous. And that's the sheer success part that I talk about with Anderson, where it's like, hey, I wasn't even looking for the opportunity. Who knows what I was doing? I wasn't even looking for the opportunity. It just fell on me. And I think that that's what you want when you go to any institution and the people that you're around. And that's the quality of people that, that you have at Anderson. Even when I was sharing recently with a, 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 a student that's trying to get into Anderson um, right here, you know, this winter, you know, he shared with me, he was like, yeah, man, I communicate to some of these other students at other universities and they don't even respond back. You know, I sent him a message on LinkedIn. They won't even respond back. But he was like, everybody at Anderson that I reached out to, he was like, they've reached back out and, and, and I've been able to speak to him. And I was like, that's what you get. You know, that's 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 what you get at Anderson. And and I've been a recipient of that as well. So, you know, the why Anderson uh, it, it, it's, it's clear cut. And, and, and for me, it, it's very simple. And that share of success is the main portion of it, which I've been a recipient of and, and happy to receive. So that's my story. Well, I love your story and I love the connection. <laughs> oh, that was fun to record. That was fun to record. I don't know. Pictures worth a thousand words and a good story is worth a thousand pictures. So uh, I just really appreciate Derek and uh, we're going to see what he creates next. It's going to be fun watching him really do the entrepreneurial route in, in sports management, sports marketing. So. All right, I've gone too long, but I want to leave some time for, for, uh, for Q&A. And um, yeah, so we got about 15 minutes. I've got a couple slides I'll wrap up with at the end. But um, yeah, um, you know, just kind of open it up. You can put questions in the chat. You can uh, just unmute, wave your hand, let me know. And, um, and we'll just see what we can, we, we can address here. And I can stay after 7:32, but you know, right now, and, and right now, the questions would be, you know, questions that you think other people want to know. If you if you have specific questions unique to you, then you know, let me hook you up with my team, with the ambassadors, uh, myself. I, I take one-on-one -on -one appointments. I, my calendar gets very full, but we have lots of resources. So the kind of questions I want to look at tonight, you know, are are maybe ones that would that would probably be germane to several other folks. You know, like I'm, I, yeah, I think I want to write my career. I want to write a new trajectory for myself. 
but I'm not sure UCLA is going to help me because of X, Y, or Z, or how would it, anything like that. So let me take some questions. Yeah, Samantha. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me, let me go with Samantha, I'll, and then I'll go with Alex. Hey, what's up? Um, uh, my question is regarding taking the entrepreneurial route versus going to work for big established corporation and sure. the um, concentrations that this specific program um, has for people wanting to take that route. Great, great question, Samantha. You know, we're a top 10 entrepreneurial program. We're excellent at entrepreneurship. The, the field study, you know, baked into the program is a capstone experience. It's a, it's a six month consultative engagement and you get to choose which field study you want. Most people do what's called the global access program where you are matched with an international early stage company. So between like five and 50 million in revenue. And typically they're doing a market expansion. They wanna leave Finland and they wanna to go to the US. They wanna leave Chile and they wanna to go to Argentina. So it's, a, it's an early stage, high tech, high growth company. You get to consult directly with the C-suite. So if you do the GAP program, you get to get a real deep dive into a going concern. You know, like what an entrepreneur looks like when they when they get past the, you know, just the ideating stage. So that's one pathway. Or the, the big fork in the road, global access program, that's our historical. But the last five or eight years, we've added what we call the business creation option. And that's the other field study you can do. And the business creation option is for people who are actually going to start their own company. And we have about 25% of our students do the BCO, it's called BCO. And it's a six month class. It's actually two classes bolted together over a six month window, same deal. It's a group environment. You pick group mates, you get a faculty advisor and you, you do everything there is to do to vet and prep and get yourself ready to launch. And the track record for the last couple of years, about half of the BCO groups actually do launch. So those are two examples of entrepreneurship. The third one is our venture accelerator, which is the entire bottom floor of the library of Anderson. That's, a, that's an incubator, that's a cross campus incubator. So it's business plus law medicine, um, graduate participation from across campus. And then the fourth one I would mention, so GAP, BCO, the business accelerator, the venture accelerator in the library. And then the fourth one is the biggest club because FEMBAS can join, there are 50 different clubs you can join. The biggest club at Anderson is, is EA, the Entrepreneurs Association. So, um, you know, just in the interest of time, I'll, I'll stop there, but we are good at entrepreneurship. The vast majority of our students do not work for Fortune 500 companies because our students are West Coast, right? Most 75% of Fortune 500 headquarters are east of the Mississippi. You know, that's just the reality of the West Coast. So we, you know, do you have a particular area you're interested in entrepreneurship? Um, I have a startup right now and I'm growing that and I'm um, creative director for another company, I'm another startup. So I'm kind of working with a few on a couple of different, like two different ones right now. You'll be happy here. You'll be very happy here, you know, because that's, you know, most successful entrepreneurs are serial entrepreneurs, just like what you're doing, because every time you go through it, it gets better, it gets easier, it gets better, it gets easier. Um, that Brian Thomas, the gentleman for, with Clutter, he, he created, he was actually like a, a linguistics major. He has a, he has a hearing challenge, and so it was very personal for him. And he, one of his first, he created this game called Mad Dragon. It's like a little card game. It's like a little deck of cards. And that was his first entrepreneurial gig. And he did that before business school. And it's like a, it's like you buy it if you're a parent and if you have kids who have kind of anger issues, you know, because mm -hmm. you pick a card and it helps you calm down, you know, mm -hmm. but, but on the podcast, he talks about, yeah, you know, I've kind of been an entrepreneur before with Mad Dragon. So, like, you know, he did it once, he did it again. And then by the time he got to clutter, you know, he was the right place at the right time. And it just went and went crazy. And, and that's having that entrepreneurial mindset it's super important, you know, to live in expensive places like LA, right? Everybody has got a side hustle in LA. 
And so it's very much part, you know, I've written my books. <laughs> I'm not a good entrepreneur, but I've written my two books. Those have been entrepreneurial endeavors since I got here. And, and I was really supported by Dean said, yeah, yeah, take some time, go write. You know, it was really cool. So, sorry. Okay, cool, thank you. Great question, sorry for the long answer. I think it was Alex was waving, uh, maybe it was, or somebody over in this part had a question. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you. Or maybe not. So anyone else had another question? Or is there one here? I think there's a good question in the chat. If after some time at FEMBA, you realize you'd be better served just going to school full-time, is that an option? Can you transfer the full-time program? Thank you, Daphne. Um, kinda, sorta. The, the thing is the full-time program, so we have three MBA pathways. Full-time, that's quit your job, be a daytime, you know, be a full-time grad student. FEMBA, that's what we talked about tonight. We also have the executive MBA program, which is like FEMBA, but it's about 40 grand more. And it's designed for people who've already been managers. So there's a lot of actual overlap. The oldest third of FEMBA and the youngest half of the executive MBA are the same profile people. They could have done either one. So you've got three different ways to get your degree at Anderson. Everybody gets the same degree. The diploma on the wall is the same. UCLA Anderson Master of Business Administration, whether you are daytime, part-time, executive. But the unit counts are slightly different and the price points are different. So Daphne, you would not be a full-time student, you'd still be a FEMBA student. But if you are in FEMBA and you quit your job, lose your job, you know, go part-time, you know, you get pregnant, you hurt your leg in soccer practice, you have a car accident, you know, people do all kinds of modifications to the program. You have to have a job when you start the program. It's the fully employed MBA program, it's in the title. But if you quit your job halfway through or lose your job halfway through, you're still a full citizen of FEMBA. Your academic standing doesn't change. And there are people, some of the people who do internships over the summer, they'll quit the job they have, do an internship, they'll get an offer and they'll say, you know what, I'm not gonna work, I'm not gonna go back to my old job. I'm just gonna take that last year and just kind of experience life as a full-time student. So you're still technically, you're technically in whatever program you start in, and if your employment status changes, you can take more classes. You can, when you get to 80 units, you can actually take four extra classes for no cost. We have that baked in. So um, if you quit your job or don't have a job that third year, you know, a lot of people will double down and take some extra electives. But you would not technically be a full-time student. You would still pay the FEMBA price and you would advance to candidacy with the FEMBA unit count. Thank you for that question. Who are the top three, let's see, Gareth, who are the top three or so professors that we should be excited to learn from? Ah, uh, am I still recording? I mean, all, you know, you never compare your children to each other. You don't compare faculty to each other. We have eight different disciplines, um, finance, marketing, accounting, decisions, operation, technology, management, um, HROB, um, you know, we've got, wonderful faculty in eight different groups. Uh, the faculty who teach the core classes, so your first year, those are all PhD research faculty. Then the faculty who teach the electives, the second half of the program are a blend of PhD research faculty and industry practitioners, people who've you know just gone out in the real world and learned from the School of Hard Knocks. And now they're, you know, basically we got a bunch of retired millionaires running around who want to pay it forward. So, um, you know, people who get talked about a lot. Our, um, our current senior associate dean, Miguel Unzueta, is in the HROB. He teaches a great class in negotiations. I hear that gets mentioned a lot on the podcast. Um, actually, a lot of our HROB faculty, uh, Professor Goldstein, uh, Jennifer Whitson, Corinne Bendersky, uh, Margaret Shi, who's now the chancellor of our Bruin X, our equity, diversity, inclusion outreach. Um, in real estate, uh, Professor Habibi and Professor Sussman, People love them. Technology management, uh, Terry Kramer, people love him. Um, like statistics, data and decisions, first quarter. Um, people love that class and nobody thinks they're gonna love it. Professor Mamer is a lion of our program. He's been here a long time. Uh, he teaches introductory, you know, the, the first quarter statistics class. So um, I don't know about three, but those those are a, a, a group. I also do have, um, and Gonzalo Fracius, my boss, he's an international tax expert. 
and people love his course. He is, he's not a PhD. He is, uh, he has a law degree, he has a, a master's in tax. And, you know, Gonzalo is, but he's the, he's the, he's the, he's my, I'm assistant dean, he's the associate dean. And he's, he's won the Decade Teaching Excellence Award. He's been teaching for 29 years. I mean, the man is a master teacher. People quote his class, you know, years after they teach him. So those are some names. But, you know, go to the faculty expertise guide. It's, it's got good stuff. Devon asks, what are some ways you prepare students for networking and next steps related to job advancement and placement? And that's because of the time, that might be our last question. I mean, I'll, I got a couple more slides. Let me answer Devon's question, a couple more slides and we'll, we'll officially end at 7.30, but I can do some more Q&A afterwards. I'm happy to do it. So Devon, one of the great things about FEMBA is that we have a dedicated career services team. Um, Susan Cal, Pam Schultz, Jackie, Matt Gorlick, um, all held together with the coordination of Brianna. We have a five person team, four full-time counselors, plus we have executives in residence. So we have career services just for the fully employed MBA program. So the full-time program is the Parker Career Management Center. We are a cousin to that and we access some resources for that, but we have a team that focuses just on FEMBA. And one of the things that'll happen if you choose to apply and you get admitted, you'll have a full day boot camp with them in the months leading up to the program. Once you do the boot camp, you have access to hundreds of hours of pre recorded um, job support. So, how to do a cover letter, how to get your resume through the resume, you know, automated artificial intelligence resume vetting, how to work LinkedIn to your advantage, how to, how to take a, a LinkedIn profile to OK to a profile that where people will be calling you and you'll be, be getting calls like you heard Derek talking about, where somebody says, hey, you got to check this out. So um, Devon, we will, we will work with you. We have you know, dedicated counselors. You can schedule one-on-ones. They typically work FEMBA-friendly hours. They work Tuesday through Saturday, kind of noon to eight at night. So they work with you after, after work hours in the evening. They take appointments all day Saturday. They run a myriad of workshops. Matt runs the Big Five, which is a strength, uh, strengths finders, strength assessment inventory. Um, you'll do inventories the summer before. Uh, you'll write your own leadership plan during during leadership foundations, the orientation week with the faculty. So, um, you know, we we get you going. Nobody knows how to network, right? Confident people think they know how. Shy people think they don't know how, but nobody knows how to network. There's a way to do it, and you get an MBA from UCLA. We will we will teach you on that. So let me pause for questions for just a second. Let me just turn on screen one second and kind of wrap up a couple slides just to get us to the finish line here. So um, this is my team. Oh, I'm sorry, there's some hands up. Okay, well, I'll, I'll come back, I'll come back. Um, this is my team, you're gonna meet Christy, Roy, Raymond, Cynthia. Cynthia's here tonight, I love Cynthia. Told you I loved her. She's, she's the one Trojan on our team, so she keeps me humble. Uh, Chris and Aaron, so this is the six person team that I'm grateful to get to go through COVID with. We've been keeping each other sane for the last year. So you'll meet all these folks. I'll give you their link to their um, addresses. They all do one-on-ones. And uh, so they are all resources to help you. And then um, we have 60, 60 ambassadors, first, second, and third year, plus alumni ambassadors. I'll give you the link for that here in just a minute. Um, Richie is one of our co-presidents, Richie, who you just heard about on the podcast. Also Jay, Fanny, and Hadley. So those are our four co-presidents. And then they run um, over, you know, they run a, a volunteer group of over 60 volunteers that um, if you go to the website link up here, uh, each one of them has their LinkedIn profile. Each one of them has their email address and they are, you know, standing by to talk to you and to give you their point of view on why they chose Anderson, why they chose FEMBA, why they're getting an MBA. So, you know, FEMBA is about a thousand days. It's a thousand days to reinvent yourself. And I'm a big fan. Your position's not important. It's your trajectory, right? The only person you want to compete with is you yourself yesterday. You never want to compare yourself to other people. You just want to be better than you were yesterday. And if you do that, if you get one tenth of a percent better every day for a thousand days, you won't recognize your life. You will raise that trajectory. You know, those of you who are <laughs> in finance and know about compound interest, this is not mathematically accurate, but it's very poetic, right? 0.1% times a thousand days is 100% better. You'll be way more than 100% better. So um, your trajectory, 
beats your position. Let's let UCLA help you write your story. That's my takeaway message tonight. Don't think about, you know, just can I get admitted? And if you do want that, go to our YM, Y, uh, say, no, excuse me, our uh, Admissions 101 with Chris, um, do our, our webinar with Roy, or our, we have our community and, and diversity events with, with Roy and Christy. We have our Ask Me Anything sessions with our ambassadors. We've got lots of ways. We've got all these podcasts. These are our deadlines. Our biggest round is round three. There is plenty of time to apply. April 6 is our deadline. You've got about six weeks to work with. Um, you want to pencil April 6th on your calendar. You just need to hit submit, get us your essays by then. Your recommenders can come later, but you got to you gotta submit by April 6th to be in round three. We may have a courtesy extension round. We may not. It depends on volume. So if you want to guarantee you get a look this year, April 6th, if we stay open past that, that'll be decided a little bit later. Super Saturday, save that day. You get a 30-minute face-to-face Zoom or phone interview, and we'll have decisions no later than June 24th. We read fast in round three because we already have round one and round two, so we will get you an answer well before the end of June, and you could start the program this year. So I'm going to take this page. These are all the links. Oops, got to go back. Um, I'm going to get these links, and I'm on... Give me just one second, we'll get these links. These are all the stories that I told you about tonight. I'm gonna to paste these in the uh, chat while we do some more Q&A. And, a. and um, you can just grab this, oops, I'm gonna paste. So you can just grab this if you want. So um, these are all of the stories that are referred to tonight. Susan Francia, the Olympian, Ed Moses, the Olympian, Brian Thomas, the $100 million guy. Uh, Dr. Nassim Afsar, she was a working uh, medical doctor with two children, Mark Lee, entertainment entrepreneur with children, Derek Cox, uh, Jermaine, and Hiro. That's the full episode. We also have one honoring veterans that we did. And then there should be, oops, and then is it at the bottom? Did it cut off? Oh, I didn't, I mean, let me get you the overall playlist. I guess I didn't copy that. Okay. Oh, and then I want to get you the links with, um, with my team and also with my team and the, the student ambassadors. So, uh, so those are a whole bunch of links. You can just grab that and copy and paste it. So officially we'll be done right now. If you need to go, I totally understand, um, but I'm happy to take some more questions and, uh, and we'll just keep going from here. But if you need to cut out, thank you for your attention. Hope uh, that we get to read your application this year. Thanks for being such a great audience and making this fun. And um, we'll, we'll be officially done now, but I'm happy to stay and um, answer some, some more questions. So uh, let's see, there was a question above from Alexander, how to decide between FEMBA and executive MBA. Okay, let me, I can take them there and then Matt, I'll come back to you. So like I said, there's a lot of overlap, the older third of FEMBA. So if you're, you know, if you're over 30 and you've been managing people or at least managing projects, you can apply to either the idea with FEMBA, excuse me, the idea with the executive MBA historically was that you needed at least a decade of experience post undergrad, and you needed to be in the world of becoming a manager. You don't have to be an executive, it, like the title, the title sometimes is, is misleading, but all of our programs, full-time, part-time executive, they're all taught by the same faculty. Everybody puts the same diploma on the wall. The benefit the average age of FEMBA walking in the door is usually 30, 31. The average age in the executive MBA is usually 37, 38. The age range of FEMBA, we're usually between about 24 and 34. Like that's mostly our class, but we'll have people in their late 30s. We'll have people in their 40s. The age range for the executive MBA program roughly is like 30 to 50 or 50 plus, right? And you know the average salary for a, for a FEMBA class, average salary walking in the door is usually about 85 to 90,000. So people are kind of at the end of the individual contributor chapter. First time managers is kind of the sweet spot, but they have executive aspirations. The, the sweet spot for the executive MBA program is you know, you're at least a first time manager or you're a second level manager, you're a director, or you're a VP or, or above. And you know the average starting salary in an executive MBA cohort is going to be like 175,000 or so. So typically executive MBA students are 
right here, right now, where FEMBA students want to be a decade from now. But everybody's on that upward trajectory. So um, EMBA's a little shorter. It's 21 months instead of 27. It's a little more expensive. It's about 40 grand more. Uh, right now, it, it's a mess because of COVID. But in normal times, um, EMBA has you know a lot of full meals and there's a housing component baked in. Whereas FEMBA, we do more you know, catering, chafing dishes with scrambled eggs. And it's, FEMBA is less fancy. It's more, you know, carbohydrates and caffeine, whereas EMBA is more sit down meals. So um, you also get twice as many electives in FEMBA. So FEMBA gives you more time to explore and you can stretch FEMBA out a lot easier. We've shortened FEMBA to 27 months, but if you want to do FEMBA in the traditional 33 months, it's very easy to do that. So if you're still kind of in the exploration chapter, FEMBA can be a better choice. It's a little less expensive and you get more time to just kick the tires and see what's out there. So I hope, you know, that was kind of a, I hope that was a little bit of a, an answer, but if you're qualified to get an MBA, you know, we're not going to have a tug of war over you. We're just going to try to figure out where you think you'd feel like it's the best fit for you, or your circumstances, right? We're just going to be happy that you get to come. So, um, can you please talk a knit and I'm just kind of go, well, I'm sorry, Matt, I said I would call on you. Matt, what question did you have? Yeah, I was just curious what the biggest challenge or hurdles have been handling the MBA program <clears throat> remotely, um, just because the effects of COVID may persist for, you know, a longer than expected period of time. Um, so wondering what it's like trying to, trying to mitigate burnout, handling, you know, everything over Zoom. And then what that transition will look like once everything's back to a state of normalcy and, and people are back uh, coming in person for classes. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I mean, it's the million dollar question, you know, like what's what's the new normal going to look like? When do we get back to regular? Oh, I'm supposed to give you, let me see. Um, <laughs> my boss told me to put this in the deck. Gonzalo told me this and I totally forgot. Oh, um, if you go to uh, if you go to our Anderson website, um, We've got a link um, to the chancellor's message. And let me find it real quick and I'll, I'll just share it with everybody. Sorry, I don't have this uh, pulled up already, but it's on. It's just on our main page. Let me just share it real quick. But, um, you know, cause we, we are subject to the health authorities of the County of Los Angeles. So we can't just do anything we want. Uh, so this is our website. So if you go right here, this is our, the front page of FEMBA on the FEMBA webpage. But this, this one here, the UC Office of the President, UC plans for fall 2021 in-person instruction across its 10 campuses. So let me grab this link and toss it into the chat. You know, that's, that's the game that we're trying to play is to be back in person in the fall. Um, you know, I think the idea is that winter, winter we're going to get all the, you know, the high priority people vaccinated. Spring is going to be, you know, less, you know, kind of more healthy people, younger people. And then, you know, we're gonna hopefully get to this tipping point where we've got some herd immunity and a critical mass. I'm not a scientist, but that's my observation of, I think where people's heads are at. We're gonna have the summer to see if it's working and, you know, people wanna get back to in-person education. I think we're gonna keep a lot of, we've learned a lot with the Zoom stuff. I think we're gonna use it for things where maybe driving down the 405 is not the best use of time and money. You know, I think we're going to be smart about we, how we use distributed teaching pedagogy going forward. But MBA students love to network. And there's, you know, there's a ton of fun that happens when you get 100 MBAs in a room and you break out the alcohol and nachos and you get the networking going, right? People miss that. So, um, you know, that's kind of the look ahead. Um, in terms of, you know, what it's been like, it's been a challenge, you know, spring last year was a fire drill, you know, and, you know, like for everybody in March of 2020, with like 10 days notice, we went all, you know, we went, we had, all of a sudden we had remote finals and then we did a remote spring quarter. Last year's class, you know, had a virtual commencement, just like everybody, high school, undergrad, grad school, you know, they didn't, they, they still haven't gotten a physical commencement. Um, I think where people are most frustrated when you read the blogs and stuff, the people who really, I think, suffered the most, like in a dramatic impact to their, to the full value of their degree are the, are the two-year programs. If you are a two-year graduate, 
who's going to be the class of 2021 and you're in a two year format. So our full time students are our executive MBA students. Four out of your six courses have been remote. You know, you just you, you just did not get to have the experience. You got the education. And if you're good online, you're building the network, but you did not get to have the experience. Right. We haven't been able to do our global immersions. Our one week study abroads have not happened since, you know, March last year. We're doing virtual study abroads, which are pretty cre creative. We're going to keep five alumni spots open for all of our study abroads for like the next three years for the alumni who missed out in this class of 2021. They'll be able to still do those um, one week travel experiences because they're incredible. People love them. It's a hallmark of our program. Um, so those have been some of the challenges. Um, does that kind of help? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Sure. You know, my third grader and my eighth grader are, you know, I mean, we're all going through this together in my household. And, um, you know, it's going to reinvent education. It's going to shake the tree. It's going to shake out some dead wood. Um, so it's an exciting time. Education is reinventing itself. And, you know, like I said, I don't think there's a graduate degree that emphasizes networking more than the MBA. So MBAs want to be back in person, but none of us love LA traffic, right? And, you know, the, some of the upside, two upsides of COVID, one is guest speakers. You know, we've had incredible guest speakers. You guys may have noticed just life in general. It seems like, you know, you have access to all this great sharing because you don't, you know, to, to get a real you know, to get a, a C-suite Fortune 50 speaker, you usually have to work three or four months in advance, you know, with their travel schedule and their commitments. It's a pain. It's just, it's hard on them. It's hard on the institution. So now, you know, it's like, yeah, but they can show up for an hour on Friday afternoon on Zoom. So the caliber of the richness of our own network that we've been able to tap into has skyrocketed. We're going to keep doing that. Everybody loves that. And one of the things that the Dean did last year for the 2020s, they said, hey, we'll just really loosen up the auditing. I told you, you can take four electives. After you get to the 80 units, you can take four electives for free. Well, we just, we just loosen that even more. And people just audited the heck out of extra electives. And people loved it, especially, you know, because two thirds of our students are in LA County, but one third of our students are not in LA County. We got people in Orange County, San Diego County, bunch of Bay Area people, Portland, Seattle, and out of state. You know, we have people who fly in from out of state. And so for all those people to, to just be able to kind of really open up the entire deck, you know, the entire week became fair game because travel was no longer an issue. So the question earlier, who are the favorite faculty? Well, if Professor Habibi was only teaching on Tuesday nights, and I'm in San Diego, it's like, oh, I don't want to drive up there just for that, even though he's great. Now I can audit the class with a remote pedagogy. So, you know, overall COVID stinks, right? We want our life back. But we've also learned some new stuff. And the access to incredible alumni guest speakers and corporate guests and the liberalizing of our auditing, because, you know, you're not really taking a seat from somebody. Those have been upgrades that I think are going to stay, even when we quote unquote go back to normal. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Blah, 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 blah. Talk about the GMAT, GRE, TOEFL requirement. Um, Nitin, yeah, all that's on our website. You need uh, you need a standardized exam. We'll, we will take the GMAT, the GRE, or the executive assessment if you've been working eight years. So any one of those three. If you were educated outside the United States in a language where English is not the mother language or it's one of many languages, then we have the TOEFL requirement. If you have a US master's degree, it waives that. Um, but yeah, all that stuff is, is, um, is pretty, it's in our admissions page and our FAQ page. So hopefully that should be pretty easy to find. Um, uh, Preetham asks, could you share your views on how Anderson can help pursue a career in tech management? Um, yeah, Terry Kramer, the professor I talked about, teaches an excellent class on tech management. Um, it's where all the jobs are. So you're going to learn a lot about it. You're going to hear a lot about it. Uh, you know, the West Coast is hiring, right? The West Coast is hiring more than the East Coast because of all the jobs in technology. So um, 
We have a dedicated sub program. What I encourage you to look up is the Easton Technology Management Program. The Easton Technology Management Program. So Jim Easton was the founder of EA Sports, I believe, and he uh, endowed the Easton Technology Leadership Program. And his joke was, you know, a lot of times you get two engineers together and they're, you know, maybe their social skills need a little, and he was an engineer, so this was not disrespectful. This was him just talking about his experience. You know, they're both kind of looking at each other's shoes and whoever looks up first must be the one with more people skills. So that guy has to be in charge. And that a lot of tech companies get formed by engineers who are awesome with manipulating the physical universe, but they just don't know management. And so the Eastern Technology Leadership Program was originally created to help technology people, so our STEM graduates, really broaden their soft skills and make themselves ready for management positions. But what's happened lately is it's now got this whole other element, which is to help non-technology people brush up on their quant skills and on their technology speak such that they can get jobs in tech because that's where all the jobs are. So that's one important element of how we get people ready for jobs jobs in tech. And then look up Terry Kramer, K-R-A-M-E-R. I think we have a, we did a, a FEMBA, Christy on my team ran a FEMBA focus on careers in tech management. And I think that's recorded on our website. You could look for that. Um, does UCLA, Crystal's offering Carino, Crystal uh, Carino, does UCLA offer financial aid other than loans? We have a small amount of financial aid, not very much. About one out of five people get a um, merit-based uh, loan. Um, if you work for UCLA, you get it. And if you are in the top, basically 20% of our admits based on your GPA and your standardized test score. So um, what we have is a $30,000 fellowship, which is a $10,000 per year reduction in the price. So we, we really don't have, we don't have full rides or anything like that. And up until five or seven years ago, we didn't even have that. Historically, your job was your scholarship was the idea. 90% of, of scholarship at Anderson goes to our full-time students because they sacrifice two years of salary to go to school. Um, thank you, Alex, for that note. Uh, other Alex, good support experiences with engineering a shift to a previous field or new field, opportunities to use language skills, Spanish, Portuguese, German. Thanks for presentation. Um, Alex Salernin, good support experiences with engineering a shift to a previous field or new field. Is that kind of a career services question? Alex, you want to tell me? I'm not quite sure I'm grabbing the question you're asking. Yeah, excuse me. I'm, I'm putting the kids to uh, debate, so excuse me if it's noisy over here. <laughs> no, I understand. Um, yeah, I just, uh, for me, I am, I'm pretty certain I want to do uh, an MBA just uh, for the last couple of years. And even now, I'm still questioning the timing. Um, you know, just how, how set do I want to be in a specific field? Um, I had a lot of good experiences in the financial field when I first came out of school and for like, uh, you know, six years, um, I was quite successful there. And then I've been teaching for the past, you know, I'm the science department head of the private school and I've been doing that for, uh, the last six years. And now I'm just sort of, you know, figuring out whether to start back in my old field and then go to the, my MBA or is the MBA going to be a good, you know, segue maker. Does that make sense? Thanks, Alex. And I apologize. I All mispronounced, right. I pr mispronounced your last name. Oh, yeah. Tell me, yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I, my, I need my glasses. Um, you know, the MBA is a, is a great um, skeleton key that can open many different doorways. And I, I'm big on metaphors. Anderson will not give you a, we don't give you a roadmap. You know, we, we basically, if we give you, we give you a lot of options and, you know, there's, it's not, there's not like one recipe that you follow. Really it's, 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 if you use cooking, we, we open up this pantry that's full of ingredients and then we give you multiple cookbooks. So you talk about Spanish, Portuguese, and German. Yeah, we got all that and, and then some. And, you know, my best advice, having done an MBA and now worked in this field for two decades, 
is you do want to use the six months before school. Like this real estate right now is precious real estate. What is this about? What is this about for me? What are my choices? What's great about UCLA? What's great about USC? Oh, I'm a faith-based person. Maybe I should go to Pepperdine or, or LMU, right? You know, like, like, what are my choices? And then if I'm in education, should I get an EDD? You know, if I want to be a principal of a school, maybe I should get an educational doctorate. But if I get an MBA, then I could, I could run a school, but I could also do for-profit work. And what do my mentors have to say about it? And what does my wife have to say about it, right? Like, like you want to talk to your trusted advisors and, and let it be a discovery. And, and, you know, the have informational interviews, look for people in life who have a career that you think you'd like to have five or 10 years from now. And if, if an MBA was part of how they got there, just get on their calendar, right? It's, 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 you know, it's called an informational interview. You know, you get taught how to do this in business school and you're not asking for your job. You're literally asking for information and people love to tell their story and they love to be listened to respectfully. And, and all you want, the only takeaway you want is, you know, you want to listen to their story, you want to ask good questions, you want to send them a thank you note, and you want to listen for connections from their journey that could help you and yours. And then at the end of it, you know, based on what I told you about me and what I've heard about you, anybody else you think that I might be good to talk to? And they'll always have somebody, yeah, you should talk to this person. And that it's kind of a build your own adventure, but it's such a good way to find out what's out there. And you can use it for the, should I go to graduate school? And then you, if you choose to go to graduate school, you can use it for the, how do I figure out what's going on in graduate school? So two pieces of advice. One is to do informational interviews with trusted mentors. And then the second piece of advice is in your process of discernment, do come up with a North star, right? In, in the essay, you're gonna, you're gonna tell us, why do you want an MBA? And you can change your mind but you want to you want to understand the broad array of resources that Anderson offers, and you want to at least figure out the ones that are kind of whispering to you. You know, there's a knock on the door. Hey, Alex, Alex, it's your future calling. You know, the kids are actually going to get out of diapers, and you're going to be get to be a grown up again, right? You know, once we get through the the young kid chapter, and what do you want to do, right? When they get into middle school and high school, and they've got their own friends, like. What do you want your life to be about? And maybe this is that reinvention chapter. And if you choose to make this big six-figure investment, you do want to, what I tell people, you want to work your plan, plan your work, and stay open-minded, all three. You do want to have a North Star. You do want to be aiming at something because there's too many choices at a place like Anderson. You'll just get lost. If, if you just kind of walk in the door and go, gosh, y'all, what's good around here? It'll just be happening too fast and you'll just, you'll frustrate yourself because you'll feel like I'm missing out on everything because there is FOMO. You're always going to be missing out on something. That's what you're paying for. You're paying for too many choices. But from that big choice group, you want to pick a North Star. I'm going to aim at real estate. I want to aim at entrepreneurship. I want to aim at finance, whatever it is, international business. Plan your work, work your plan, but then don't be rigid. You do want to save that 10 or 15%. And the reason I played you Derek's soundbite you know, Derek had a had a classmate call him out of the blue and say, what are you up to? And I'm like, oh, nothing. <laughs> well, you should be on this, you should be in this sports business association Zoom meeting right now because these guys are speaking your language and I'm going to record it for you. And I'm going to send you the recording and then you need to track the guy down. And Derek, stop, start, change, did that, right? You know, Derek kept himself in a in an agile modality and and then, you know, got this killer internship that's now on his resume, Paradigm Sports. So I have been an NFL player for seven years. I've done an internship at Paradigm Sports. I'm a, about to be graduate of UCLA Anderson. And I'm looking for people to back me up. I want to do a new kind of sports marketing. You know, that's the world that he's building for himself. So you, Alex, may bring some of, you know, this part of your career, this part of your time as a teacher, and then you bring all that to the party and maybe you want to do, you know, there's, they're, they're just gads of opportunities in edutech, right? People who understand classroom delivery, but then are curious and interested in scalable platforming and subscription modeling and pay for tutoring, right? 
you know, and you'll meet somebody like Samantha, who's an entrepreneur already, right? Like, that's kind of what I'm trying to paint the picture of tonight. I want you to see what it looks like with these stories that we tell. And, um, you know, but again, we're not going to give you just one recipe. We're going to put a lot of recipes out there and, and you get to dabble and you get to experiment and, and try different combinations of ingredients as you're building it out for yourself. So I know that's kind of a poetic answer, but it's my, it's my best observation of what it is that I see that happens here. You know, the, the big proof point for all these podcasts is people are happy. You know, I just don't come across people like, I don't want to be in your damn podcast. That didn't work. You know, like, that never happens, right? I've got all these wonderful alumni. Speaking of, of like real estate and stuff that got mentioned earlier, I interviewed a guy today named Chihiro, who's a 2014 grad who's back in Dallas. And I sent the I sent the Black History Month drive time. I sent that out on Saturday to the alumni. And he listened to it and he wrote back and said, "Hey, I'm doing you know private equity real estate investing. You know, you think we could do a podcast?" So we did like an exploratory interview today, and he married a classmate. So I'm like, "Man, Chihiro, yeah, I want to tell him about. I mean, he's he's already turned his first. He he created an investment platform and and bought a 128 unit property in Abilene, Texas." And, uh, you know, refurbished it and sold it for a profit. And now he's got a 220 unit property in Dallas, you know, and he wants to talk about that. And I'm happy to talk about that. But I'm also like, Chihiro, I want to hear about your wife, Kristen, because <laughs> they met through a classmate named Manuel, who was from Mexico City, who worked for an airline, who was flying up here to do FEMBA and had a salsa party, <laughs> you know. And so I want to tell Chihiro's story sure to talk about real estate, but also to hear, you know, how he and Kristen are now a dual income family, two MBAs living in Dallas because they took his Toyota, you know, he's with Toyota when Toyota went to Plano. So, you know, it's, but, you know, the guy's hustling. He's still working full-time for Toyota and, you know, he went back to school to become a real estate investor and he's, you know, taking the lessons he heard from Sussman and Habibi forward. So let me do one or two more questions and then it's, um, Kind of thank you so much. That was that was a lot. Yeah, that was great. Really glad I asked. Oh yeah, thank you, thank you. Let me let me do one more, and then we'll we'll kind of hey, wrap. Dylan. Up. Yeah. I just had a, a quick question for you. Um, for sure. I've spoken with a few of your uh, team members, Roy, Christy, and uh, Chris recently. I was just kind of interested uh, what your role is uh, within the FEMBA program. I try to hide behind those guys as much as possible. No, <laughs> I mean, I'm the assistant dean. So there are, so Gonzalo has two lieutenants, Bonnie Kim and myself are the two assistant deans. Okay. So I'm an administrative dean. I teach on the side, you know, I'm not a professor per se. I teach workshops and classes. And, um, you know, I've been here long enough that I'm now kind of institutional memory. And then I'm, I'm, a, I'm a creative. So I've come up with a lot of the elements um, you know, the FEMBA Palooza event we run each summer, that was mine. Super Saturdays that we run, that was something I created uh, with one of my former employees, Matt Gorlick. We, you know, although Matt gets 90% of the credit, we came up with the, with the fellowships. So I do a lot of institution building, community building, um, but the day-to-day -day running of the admission side of the house, that's really, Chris is my director of operations. Raymond runs our marketing and communications. Christy and Roy are the primary associate directors who do you know, direct one-on-one -on -one counseling. Plus they run our um, equity diversity outreach, our community spotlights, our, our tech focused stuff. Raymond manages the ambassadors. Cynthia, who was on the call um, is our, she's our office manager when we're physically together. Aaron is, our, is the manager who runs the compilation. So I oversee that and then, you know, and then I work on special projects with the deans. So I do do one-on-ones, but just not very many. I just don't, you know, have the, the bandwidth. So I try to, I try to do community building through these um, first-person long-form storytelling formats, um, you know, just because it's it's better leverage, right? Right. So um, okay. I appreciate. Yeah. It. I was just kind of curious. I had, I know I'd sent you an email a few weeks ago. I just wasn't sure if you were uh, more on the administrative side or if you were in another. Portion. I was just curious. Yeah, I mean, I answer all of my emails slowly. I just get a lot. So, you know, that's a lot of times I'm going to send people who I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to refer them to, to Christy and Roy because I, I have, I don't have to, I get to do all the referrals from faculty and alumni. 
Um, and there are a lot of those. So those become where I spend a lot of my one-on-one -on -one time. But we're all available, you know, we don't get a commission, we don't get a toaster. So, you know, we want you to get your answers. And, and that's why we have our 60 ambassadors too. Because, uh, you know, all the stuff that we can say that's sort of the rules and regulations, that's all on the website. Um, you know, we want to work with people more on the qualitative, could I, would I, should I, part of, of mapping this out for themselves. Okay. Well, I look forward to getting my application in. Hope you have a good one. Thanks, Caleb. You too. All right, I'll answer Renee's. What other FEM MBA program out there do you consider FEMBA's biggest competition? Okay, I'll end with this question, Renee, if she's even still here or he. Um, you know, I don't really, you know, God bless USC, um, you know, and God bless Pepperdine and LMU, our faith-based offerings. You know, you know, we're part of the University of California, so that gives you Irvine, San Diego, Rady, Davis, Berkeley. Um, I really, you know, I don't look at it about competition that way. I think our biggest competition is the fear of like spreading oneself too thin and the price tag and, you know, and just the, I think our biggest competition is, is our UCLA undergrad reputation where nine out of 10 people in Southern California applied to UCLA as an undergrad and didn't get a chance to go. And it's like, ah, why do I want to apply to that school again? So um, I don't really frame our competition in terms of other MBA programs. I really frame it in terms of you got to develop a big enough game to make this six figure investment in you worth it. And then if you kick the tires and if you've got a decent GPA and a decent test score and you've got some traction in your world, we're going to want to admit you. So, you know, a little bit's like you kind of got to bring a little of your own confidence and swagger to the grad school game because grad school is not undergrad and, and graduate programs want to admit good people. So, I don't know if that helps Renee or not. Renee may have already left, but that'd be my that'd be my answer on that one. So thank you guys for staying to the bitter end. Um, I'll record this. We'll send the link around. If um, any of those podcasts are helpful, you know, I encourage you to dabble with that. All the podcast interviews interviewees are available on LinkedIn, even the alumni. So um, thanks very much for this session tonight. Really appreciate your attention. If you're going to apply this year, we can't wait, and uh, you got about six weeks to work with. So. Have a great night, everybody, and we'll we'll stop it there. Thanks, Dylan.